Hi everyone, this is Barbara Lavarge from University of North Carolina, Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care. I'm going to talk to you today about one of my favorite critical care topics, pulmonary hypertension in the ICU. It's one of my favorite topics because it's one that can appropriately generate a lot of anxiety, but understanding of the involved physiology can go a really long way to achieve better outcomes. When we talk about patients with pulmonary hypertension in the ICU, many people's minds will go directly to patients who might be like many of my outpatients with group 1 PAH who happen to become critically ill, which is overall an uncommon occurrence. More common than this, we manage patients in the ICU who we might not call pulmonary hypertension during rounds, but for whom these same principles are very relevant. And so understanding of the critical physiology of pH in the ICU is going to be much more applicable to routine critical care than you might think. So let's start with some definitions. What is pulmonary hypertension? How do we define this term? Keeping it very simple, pulmonary hypertension is exactly as it sounds. It's an elevated blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries, not rocket science. Now when I give this type of lecture in the outpatient setting, I make sure to note that the pulmonary artery pressure that I care about is the mean pulmonary artery pressure. And the cutoff for abnormal is going to be a mean pulmonary artery pressure that's greater than or equal to 25 millimeters of mercury. Now critically ill patients, they don't really behave like outpatients. So having knowledge of the strict cutoff is not that important. Just using the term pulmonary hypertension does not tell me why a patient's pulmonary artery pressure is elevated. Therefore, we need to break it down a little bit further. And here's where we have to go into physics. Ohm's law, V equals IR, somewhere there in the back of your brain. If we apply Ohm's law to fluid flow, we get a delta P or a driving pressure is gonna be equal to a flow or Q times a resistance. And then if we apply this equation specifically to the pulmonary circulation, our driving pressure is our upstream minus our downstream pressure or the mean pulmonary artery pressure minus left atrial pressure. And I will note here that we'll often use wedge pressure because this is a pressure we can actually measure in the ICU. This is going to be equal to our flow through the pulmonary circulation, which is cardiac output times a pulmonary vascular resistance or PVR. Now I can rearrange this equation slightly to get mean pulmonary artery pressure is equal to cardiac output times PVR plus left atrial pressure. So when I'm talking about someone who has pulmonary hypertension or an elevation in their mean pulmonary artery pressure, I can identify three different causes of that. Either I have an elevated cardiac output, an elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, or an elevated left atrial pressure. Pulmonary hypertension that's due to cardiac output elevations alone, not really going to be a problem I'm concerned about in my patients. However, patients who have pulmonary hypertension due to an elevated pulmonary vascular resistance well, they're going to be the patients I'm most concerned about. So now I'd like to take a short aside to ask an important question. Why do we care? Why in the ICU is pulmonary hypertension important and what are the consequences of it? When I ask this question to a group of learners, I typically get one of three responses. One would be that the patients have refractory hypoxemia, that these patients are very hard to oxygenate, maybe hard to extubate. The second response is that there are hemodynamic concerns that they become hypotensive and go into shock easily. And the third is that they have problems with bleeding, that the pulmonary arteries hemorrhage because of the high pressure, which always makes me think of pulmonary arteries exploding and sounds awful. So which would you guys say would be the most likely concern or the most important concern to consider? Those who said B, well, that's the right answer. And that's not to say that patients with pulmonary hypertension can't have hypoxemia or pulmonary hemorrhage. They absolutely can, but those are not the most pressing issues when it comes to intensive care unit for most. So for the purposes of this simplified lecture, think of pH in the ICU as being a great cardiovascular concern. These patients die a very cardiogenic death that is driven by dysfunction and failure of the right ventricle. The right ventricle is a very different structure than the left ventricle. The pulmonary vasculature is low pressure and low resistance circulation. And right ventricular afterload, defined as wall stress by the law of Laplace, including also ventricular pressure within that equation, it's usually quite low, particularly as compared to the LV. And structurally, the RV is ill-equipped to handle these increases in afterload. It is truly the Achilles heel of the right ventricle.
So what happens to the RV when it's faced with acute or acute on chronic increases in RV afterload? Well, I'm going to take you through the consequences of that. So to start, we'll make note that an increase in RV afterload is going to lead to a decrease in right ventricular output. In the case of acute PE, for example, the RV is not going to be able to maintain that same stroke volume because of the pulmonary embolus, so RV output decreases. And then as RV output decreases, accordingly, the LV preload is also going to decrease. And if LV preload is down, well, then LV output is also going to decrease. So the other consequence of an increase in RV afterload is going to be that the RV starts to dilate. It's backing up with blood. And particularly as the RV is dilating more and more, that's going to create a stretch on the tricuspid annulus and actually going to pull it apart and further increase the amount of tricuspid regurgitation that's occurring. And we'll see this as further worsening the right ventricular output. Now here I need to introduce one of the most important concepts in this physiology, and that is the concept of ventricular interdependence. And what I mean by this is, while blood flow occurs in series from RV to pulmonary circulation to LV, the RV and the LV cannot function in isolation from each other. Something that happens to the RV, such as RV dilation, it's also going to affect the LV, and vice versa. This is because they touch one another. They occupied a shared space within the thorax. Most importantly, they share the interventricular septum, and there are also shared fibers in a pericardium. I'm drawing here a cross-sectional view of the normal heart such that you would see as a parasternal short axis echo view, where there is a nice donut-shaped LV with a crescent-shaped RV. In my patient with increased RV afterload and resulting RV dilation, I will see a flat septum and a D-shaped or sometimes even crescent-shaped squished little LV with a large and compressive RV. So going back now to my flow chart, I will add the important element of leftward septal shift, developing as a result of increased RV dilation and also decreased LV preload. This septal shift is going to further worsen my LV output. For those interested, this is the important reason why patients with pulmonary hypertension that's driven by left heart failure do not have the same troubles as those in whom pH is driven by high PVR, because the elevated left heart pressures will be pushing right back against the septum, preventing this shift from occurring. From here, I want to next focus on how this all affects oxygen supply and demand balance within the RV. With the increased afterload and pressure generation from the RV, oxygen demand is going to increase. However, if left ventricular output decreases, it also means that flow through the coronary arteries decreases, and thus oxygen delivery to the RV is going to be lower. Having higher RV afterload and intraventricular pressures is also going to decrease blood flow to the myocardium because the perfusion pressure gradient will be lower. The combination of more oxygen demand and less oxygen supply will lead to RV ischemia, and this is going to further decrease our RV output. You can hopefully see from going through all this that the patient can develop a self-perpetuating cascade that leads to continued progression of the low LV output state, ultimately with cardiogenic shock or collapse. Now there are a lot of conditions that a patient might present with that either start or accelerate this cycle, and how significant an impact these conditions will have will depend on the severity of the insult and whether there is a chronic elevation in RV afterload. What things in the ICU might increase PVR and worsen RV afterload? Hypoxemia of any cause, ARDS, pneumonia, COPD. Acute pulmonary embolism is a very important consideration, as acute PE, when massive, can cause cardiovascular collapse by all of these very mechanisms that we just discussed, even in the healthiest of patients with no chronic problems with RV afterload. Other insults to RV afterload? ingestion of cocaine or methamphetamines, or for my outpatients with known group 1 pulmonary arterial hypertension, the sudden cessation of their PAH treatments will cause an acute increase in RV afterload. RV dilation could worsen if my patient stops taking their diuretics or they have a heavy dietary salt intake, and patients with chronic PAH may become very ill if something compromises coronary flow to the RV, 
like another cause of hypotension, sepsis, hypovolemia, or an acute right coronary artery thrombosis from CAD. Similarly, there are a number of things we might do in the ICU as part of usual care, which might not be a good thing for someone with pulmonary hypertension. Giving IV fluids, for example, is a reflex reaction to the hypotensive patient, but in these patients, it will only worsen RV dilation and this whole cycle. If my patient has a lot of atelectasis or I allow them to have low oxygen levels or high PCO2, I will worsen afterload. Intubating a patient with pulmonary hypertension should never be avoided if needed, but it is one of the scariest things I can do to a patient with pH. For induction, I'll be giving them a sedative that drops their systemic vascular resistance, potentially leading to hypotension, decreased coronary flows, and the drop in LV afterload will also provoke more leftward septal shift. Some induction agents are also going to be myocardial depressants. And then I put my patient on positive pressure ventilation, which particularly if I use too high pressures or volumes will compress my pulmonary vasculature and increase RV afterload further. So hopefully all that we discussed describes why patients with pulmonary hypertension are so complex to manage in critical illness. The positive feedback cycle is sometimes referred to as RV auto aggravation, but I usually refer to it as the RV death spiral. Understanding this cycle will help you identify things that might make your patient worse. And in a separate session, we will talk about how it will also help identify ways to make your patient better by targeting therapies that improve RV afterload, increase systemic vascular resistance and blood pressure, decrease RV dilation, and increase RV contractility, we can hopefully get our patients out of this spiral. More on this next time.